pretty cool, isn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> okay, uh, we are now at the uh, underground tour. We're just waiting for the place to open and for us to head in there. Pardon? Uh, I'm just making a documentary, oh. seeing what's going on. And, yeah. Three, four, five, six. So, Zach. What do you think of the tour so far? Anything what? What do you think of the tour so far? Oh! The, yeah. I think it's pretty nice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I really do enjoy being here. Mm -hmm. Sweet. Fun. The tour is now officially beginning. Any thoughts? I'm scared. Cool. <laughs> Yep. Okay, I'm recording. <laughs> it's so flashing, that's not good. <laughs> yeah, the lights appear to be flickering, however, and according to the tour guide, that is not good. <laughs> and then he takes off and then where we can't see him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm gonna take a video too. You can see the tides are starting to come in. The tides come in twice a day and flood the streets. Now, it wasn't severe, it's more like a mud puddle, it was a mess. But the biggest problem because of tidal activity, sewage disposal. Now at first they tried outhouses. You know about outhouses, I assume. Back then they were common and simple. You dig a very deep pit, you put a structure over that pit, which worked out great for the people that lived on the hills. That's dirt up there, dig that hole as deep as you please. Did work out quite so well for the people that live on the tide flats. We've all tried to dig a hole into the beach. What happens? Fills with water, and everything from the bottom of the hole rises to the top. Yeah, let's go Italian soda. <laughs> oh, yeah. Picked up some great ideas of that conference and how to fight the fire. Came back after they put the fire out. So now the city actually had a great chance to start over. By the way, no one died from the fire. So this is the second chance to start over, correct that big mistake, build downtown above sea level. And the, the actual reconstruction of the city was simple, and it was also a giant mistake. Now the buildings went up first after the fire. Because it was private property, building owners wanted to get back to business, or business owners wanted to get back to business. So right behind it is a lower level of a building built after the fire. It's a six-story high building. That building went up in only three years. But here's the issue. The building owners decided to rebuild at the original issue level the tide from here. Well, at some point, the merchants got tired of losing their customers to barrels. They went back to the city and said, fix this, but make it quick, make it cheap. The city delivered on both premises. This is the true key to the story. It's the way they built the new sidewalks. Now I'm going to point to the gray beam above and take it away. Go higher. Go a little bit higher. You'll see a rusted out eye beam. I also want to point out there's a sidewalk above you, a curved sidewalk. Someone is walking above you. Try to think of that sidewalk above your head as a bridge. So this is the way they built the bridges or the sidewalks after the fire. That's where the term skid road originated. It's a logging term. Beat skidding trees down the hill. And then uh, the waterfront. Uh, First, this is First Avenue. Back then, it was actually the waterfront. So all the sawmills are on the waterfront. So it's a pretty good system. Cut the trees down, skid them down, process the trees and sawmills on the waterfront. And then when tides rose high enough, the sawmills were built on pilings. So you could literally parallel park your ship next to the mill, load up with Seattle timber. So the pilings chose this site because of the money to be made off the trees and the hills. Now, I think you'll agree the hills today in Seattle are pretty steep. 
They were actually three times steeper before the fire. They were found out. Out of a population of roughly 25,000 people, 2,500 young women listed their occupation as seamstress. Yeah, that's what the city thought. They thought that was a little dubious because at that time the population of the city was mostly male. It consisted of miners, loggers, sailors, and dock workers. Pretty rough crowd. I don't think they really cared about many in a hole in their pants. The city decided to do further research. They got together a very elite group of male volunteers. And after two months of very exhaustive research, <laughs> yeah, right, this is what they found out. Those 2,500 young women lived in a three block area by Occidental Avenue. The nickname for the neighborhood was called the Whitechapel Neighborhood, which is a Jack the Ripper reference. Not only that, they couldn't find one single sewing machine. <laughs> now I talked about skylights. So once again, before the plague period, they used the tunnels for shopping, very informal. There were some storefronts. As a matter of fact, that door leads to Rocky Mountain Chocolate. Rocky Mountain Chocolate is right above us. You saw that outside. They can actually access the underground through that door. So this skylight is at the corner of First Avenue, Yesler Avenue, in front of Rocky Mountain Chocolate. So there was real simple shopping, build stairs, uh, stairs down to the goods on pallets, and then bring in skylights for natural light. And uh, that okay, went on until really they annoying. down yeah. the underground. Then the underground was used for everything illegal. Also, it was used as a junkyard and a dumping ground. And most of this debris is actually from Seattle's strongest modern earthquake. 1949, Seattle experienced a 7.1 earthquake. They took the rubble from above and they dumped it down here. It went on this way until the 1960s. In the early 1960s, uh, people like our founder, Bill Spidell, business people, and also building owners decided we can make money off of the tunnels again. So they pushed out the crime, they stopped dumping, and the neighborhood slowly came back. A couple more.